you've made it to 50 years, <laughs> but let's start right at the beginning. Uh, can either of you remember the first time you tasted wine and what you thought of it? Uh, at home, uh, I would have been underage, but my dad used to got in the habit of bringing wine home because he worked in uh, St James's in London. That's a wine area, so yeah, he'd bring bottles home and let me have a little sip. And uh, I don't say I liked it, but I tried it. Oh, with me it's slightly different <laughs> because uh, coming from a Scottish Presbyterian family, we didn't do a lot of drinking. Um, but we used to have wine on special occasions, you know, sort of maybe three times a year. Though my father was absolutely delighted when I married a wine merchant. <laughs> yeah, my dad was pretty pleased too when I became a wine merchant. <laughs> Tony, can you tell me about your first trip to Bordeaux? Well, yes, I was. Uh, I got interested in uh, France through not school at all I was very bad at French but I watched films like uh, Gigi and uh, Jacques Tati and uh, Maigret and such like and I thought France looked fantastic so, and the pop culture you loved yeah I liked the music and um, uh, my grandmother one day met a French lady who said uh, she lived in Bordeaux and grandmother said, oh, my son would like to go and pick grapes, can you arrange that? And the nice French lady uh, said yes and I, I left school shortly afterwards and went to Bordeaux and, and they found me uh, uh, a job in a, in a uh, well it's an archaeological dig to start with. Uh, but I, I was lodged with a couple who ran a, uh, well, he ran a winery, and um, I, I confessed I wasn't really an archaeologist, but I'd love to work in the winery, please. And he, he said, OK. So he put me on the bottling line, and I spent the summer bottling wine. That was my first, those three months, I came back knowing a bit about wine and speaking French. Very nice, got me going. What, what do you think you'd be doing now if your grandmother hadn't bumped into that nice French lady all those years ago? You know, I haven't the faintest idea. At the time, I had no idea of, of what I wanted to do. I, I just wanted to go to France. That was all. I didn't think that there would be a career in it at all. I mean, I'd, I had no idea about careers. Um, you were different when you knew what you wanted to do. I had no idea what I wanted to do. No idea. You, know, you had aspirations for architecture and various things, didn't you? Yeah, my, I, yeah, I had an idea about being uh, becoming an architect, but uh, every single school of architecture I applied to turned me down, so that killed that one. So when was the first time then, after you came back from Bordeaux for those three months, that you thought wine was something you wanted to do as a career? Uh, well, it was um, a few years later, so I did, I did go to university, um, and... I, I did get a degree of sorts, uh, but after uh, university I still didn't have a job and I still didn't have much of an idea. So I went back to washing bottles for a bit and then I spent the whole year in France and tried to get jobs with wine merchants in Bordeaux. Not, not a lot of success again, uh, but then one day the, the man, uh, Monsieur, I always called him Monsieur, he, people I stayed with and who ran the winery, he said, well, why don't you sell our wine, sell our wine in England? And, ooh, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I could go around selling wine and then come, come down to Bordeaux and fetch it and take it back and deliver it. <laughs> that was my business plan. I, I don't suppose that would have worked too well with the Dragon's Den, but that was my plan. <laughs> So you came back from Bordeaux and you started selling Monsieur's wine? I, um, well my dad helped, he got a few of his friends to order cases and then I sent out a letter to, uh, Monsieur had helped me, we, we drafted a letter signed by him saying uh, you know, he, he would like uh, people to try his wine and uh, this, uh, his representative would be happy to call and give a wine tasting. And I sent out a hundred of those and I got two, two acceptances, which I thought was awful, but wasn't. 
Uh, both, in fact, I went and gave them a tasting, and they both both ordered wine. So it, it got going, but you know, th uh, that took about two months to to sort of sell two cases. So it wasn't very fast. It was mostly friends' recommendations from those two people, wasn't it? it kind yeah, of mushroom from there. Then it then it kind of grew. They they told their friends about me, and well, by by other things, you know, words, word of mouth and stuff. It, it, it grew, it's very, it's very small, but for a long time. You'd met Barbara a couple of years earlier at university. How did Barbara then get involved in the business? Well, I was never, I never thought of wine as a career. Um, and I'm a scientist by training, um, and I've got a very logical mind. My father was an accountant, so I'm very numerate and all those kind of things. So I just loved the business side, and I, Tony and I had rekindled our friendship, and I could see how well he was doing with the wine and all the rest of it. But actually, the business side was an absolute mess. <laughs> so <laughs> she kept so, coming along and saying, "You're you, doing it all wrong. You should do it this way. You should do it that way." And eventually, she said, "Okay, if you're so great at it, why don't you do it?" So, <laughs> so I left my job. I, I had um, a good career path, and. Um, I left it to go and work in the wine industry with my boyfriend and my boss thought I was crazy to do those things, so. And under a railway arch. <laughs> oh yes, no proper offices. With, a, with, a, with an office made from a packing yes, case. Yes, he made me an office out of a packing case, so. Um. Big packing case. <laughs> <laughs> so you've grown from that little railway arch in Windsor to the largest home delivery wine merchant in the world. Did either of you ever think that that would happen? No. No, I think um, I think we had too much fun along the way to um, to th think that far ahead, and and to have that kind of ambition would maybe drive you in a different direction. And we were just we had a, we were growing organically um, at a pace that we could more or less, not always, but more or less cope with. Um, and I think, in retrospect, that was a good thing to do because we we kept this um, we, we kept a lot of the good things that uh, you know we'd started with. You know, the 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 the, the one to one relationship with the customers and with the growers. Um, and I think if you have a plan to dominate the world at the beginning, those are the kind of things that you would jettison fairly early on. Um, so I think we've been able to keep quite a lot of what we think is precious along the way. I always found it difficult to think beyond next week. You know, so I couldn't think about years ahead. I just, if I had a, a dream, it was, uh, yeah, I wanted a little place in Bordeaux and I wanted a little place in Windsor or where, you know, where, where it all started. And I would shuttle between the two. That I thought was a pretty good way of life. Especially if Barbara was doing all the hard work. <laughs> You'd grown into this huge wine business, very successful. When did you decide that it was time to take a step back and hand the day-to-day -day management over to somebody else? <laughs> when I had a heart attack. I had a heart attack. Barbara had a brain hemorrhage. That We thought that, that somebody up there was telling us, um, maybe, uh, maybe take it a bit easier. You know, if you want to see, if you want to see this thing progress. Um, and we had three young boys. Yeah, we had three little kids. Yeah. So it was it was pretty self-evident that we had to do so. The doctors told us, didn't they? They, they said, you know, you should you should sell the business, retire. And uh, we thought, no, no way. This is our baby. As much as you know, we've got four babies, we've got three boys and one business. Uh, I think we were. Um, really lucky found a team that uh, grew the business in a, in a way I don't think we well I'm sure we couldn't have done it they did it we did learn um, very early on to work with a management team and this is the biggest hurdle for entrepreneurs when they have to let go um, and they usually do it much later in their careers but we had to do it reasonably early on because of the, you know, the health problems. So I, looking back, it was a good thing. We just didn't think so at the time. <laughs> do you have a favourite wine and what is it? Well, of course I have a favourite wine and it's my wine. 
and, it, and it, it it is for everybody that's had anything to do with making wine. Your your favourite wine, your favourite is yours. I I my La Chateau La Clarière. It's uh, La Clarière is the vineyard that belonged to Monsieur and Madame, and they asked me to buy uh, after a few years, and it was the first vineyard I'd ever set foot in. I knew it. I knew it. Had potential. He believed it had potential, lots of potential, but it was uh, it was just not known. And he he, he wanted me to, to make it go. So yeah, you know, we threw lots of our effort, some well, all all the spare money we had, and a lot of effort into this vineyard. And um, ah, it's my passion, isn't it? <laughs> absolute passion for me is that place and um, you know I'm going then again next week for the harvest I can't wait I love it wine's an emotional thing people people don't get that sometimes it's it's emotional so what you like is is what matters and pe- people people say you know I don't know much about wine but I know what I like that's all that matters how about you Barbara is your favorite wine your own well uh Mm-hmm. It's, diff- it's difficult to say, and I, you know, wine, after all, is a beverage, and what you eat and what you drink affects how you feel. Uh, it's, it's just being curious about, you know, just try anything. Um, it's it's really boring, as Tony said. You know, you've got you've got hundreds of thousands of sources of wine, and every single one is different. So, just keep trying. You know, Len Evans's great thing was. Uh, You've only got, he said, you know, you realise you've only got so many occasions to drink wine left in your life. You, could, you can do a calculation, you know, what's your life expectancy and times, how many times a week you drink? Two bottles a week, but his more like two bottles a day, wasn't it? <laughs> so, but but he's, he's, he said, you know, you, you, can, you can drink ordinary wine, fine. But when you drink ordinary wine, you're you're effectively taking a bottle of really interesting, fantastic wine and smashing it against the wall. Because you're not going to get the opportunity to drink that wine because you've been drinking an ordinary wine. So I asked you if your favourite wine was your wine. So it seems appropriate to talk about wine bowls. Oh, yes. Well, I do love it, obviously. (laughs) Because I like sparkling and um, and I love being part of the... um, the English and Welsh, well, the UK um, wine producers circle. Um, most people will know how how well it's doing, and you know, uh, and we've just had in 2018 the most fantastic vintage ever. Um, but it's farming, so it comes and goes, and it's not been that easy a year this year because. The weather's been all over the place, and the one thing a vine likes is consistency in the weather. But to have, you know, 20 degree variations in the temperature and monsoon rain one week, and then total dryness for a month or whatever, it's it's, it's not easy. But um, it is getting easier because the climate is changing, um, and I, I do love wildfold. And, and luckily, we planted, um, we started planting in 2003, so. We've got a, a reasonably mature vineyard um, and we should be harvesting again in two or three weeks' time. It spends all the time there. <laughs> I hardly ever see her these days. I, I thought I was the wine person in the family. Not anymore. Oh, a secret to a happy marriage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but build, yeah, everybody should have their own vineyard. Yes, or equivalent. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we are chalk and cheese and our best man told Tony's mother before we got married that it wasn't going to work. But that was a long time ago, so... He didn't really mean it. It was his wife that said that. Yes. <laughs> family, if you, if you can make it work within the family, it's, it's, it's brilliant. There, there are testing moments, but aren't there always? Mm. <laughs> we started by saying that you've just made it to 50 years. Mm. What's happening in the years to come? Shouldn't ask us, should <laughs> We're... Uh, no, we're not. We're not going anywhere. We're not. We're not retiring. But it is true to say that uh, the next generation are calling the shots yeah, now. They are. They are. And and you know, they understand that the world, the modern world. Uh, well, I, I can't speak for 
wouldn't speak for Barbara, but for myself, you know, the modern world is very different to the one I started out in. So I um, I struggle a bit, but they don't. They it's, it's their world, and they're they're doing they're doing very well. So I think we'll be all right. I think we'll be fine. <laughs>